So welcome back to the Engineered Angler. My name is Franco. I'm a professional engineer, a lure designer, a lure builder, and an avid angler. And today I want to make a lure that has a really classic look in that I don't want to paint it. <laughs> Just a completely naked lure, all wood grain. I think I'll even make the bib out of the same wood. Now I thought about making it out of cypress, which is an easy wood to work. It can have a nice grain, but it's not really a really pretty grain. Then I considered this cherry. This stuff is nice. It's very rosy colored. It's not as easy to work. It's a little harder, but it does look really nice. But I've made a bunch of lures with this stuff. So I'm going to go ahead and make it out of this stuff. It's teak. This is a chunk of teak that I bought to do some trim work on my sailboat. Teak has a really nice grain, but the color on it can really vary. It can be kind of yellow, yellow green. It can go to a kind of honey color and even kind of rosy color. So I'm not sure what this is going to look like, but I'm really jazzed to make a lure out of teak. So I want to make it a floating crankbait and I want it to be shaped sort of like a pilchard or a, a green top. And I'm not going to do any fancy carving. But maybe I'll go ahead and have sort of a cutout for the mouth and we'll definitely have an eye. And I don't want it to dive super deep. I'm going to use this in relatively shallow water. So I'm going to have a smallish dive bib and I'll have it set at about 45 degrees. But we're going to shoot for a pretty aggressive swimming action. So I'm going to keep the tie on eye close to the root of this dive bib. And I'll put the hook eyes in their usual location. And because my intention is to have this lure really be clean, very smooth, and just show off the wood grain, I don't want to have to drill any holes in it after the fact. I want to shape it, sand it, and have it be pristine. And so I have to insert the weight and the hook eyes before all that happens. That means I'm going to have to do it in two halves. So I'll have a wire harness built into the lure, and any weight I want to add to it has to be added while I'm doing all the work on the interior. So I have to decide now where I want that weight. Now, typically I like to put the weight at the center of rotation where the lure body is sort of crisscrossing. And typically that location is somewhere back, somewhere about between about a quarter of the way back or slightly less than a quarter of the way back from the nose. Now, I'm sure a lot of people have a lot of theories on where to put the weight, but principally in keeping with physics, what you want to do is keep the weight low and as close to the center of rotation as you possibly can kind of guess. The idea is that you want the weight to give it stability but not to hinder the action. Now I get a lot of questions about how to correct problems with crankbaits. And a lot of folks will write me and say, hey, I got, I got a lure that I really like, but it tends to want to rotate or roll up to one side. And they'll ask if there's anything they can do with internal weight. And the sad truth is that not likely because the hydrodynamic forces on the lure are so much greater than anything you can achieve with just a little bit of mass. So as a rule of thumb, when you put weight in a crankbait, you should think of it really as being there for static stability so that it sits nice and straight and floats or sinks or suspends however it is you designed your lure. And you really shouldn't think of it as something there to create any specific kind of action. So I'll place the weight 25% of the way back from the nose of the lure and the amount of weight I put in it, I'll calculate once I got the lure shaped. So I'm going to shoot for about four and a half inches in length and we'll shoot for an inch and a quarter for the depth of the lure. Now I can cut some half inch slabs out of this. I'll cut one more out. Now it's just a matter of sanding these surfaces really smooth so in the end they can be glued together really well. Seems like it'll work. Now I'm kind of looking at the grain and seeing if I can make it match from one side to the other. I've got this dark line running down here and you flop it over and I have the same line running from the same end on a very similar angle. Now I'm just going to temporarily glue these together with a little bit of contact cement. I'll give this thing a squeeze in the vise. Give it a few minutes just to set up so I know it won't come apart on me when I'm shaping it.
right, so I'm trying to get as much work done while I still have square sides. So I've drilled the location of the eyes, I've rough cut the bib slot, and now I've gone ahead and sketched in some guidelines so I can shape it from front to back. All right, so at this point, a lot of folks will get out their carving knife and start taking a lot of material off so they can get it down closer to the shape they really want and then get a nice final sanding on it. But I like shaping mine with a belt sander. I've learned to do it over time and I have a lot of control and I feel a lot more confident than I do with a blade. But this is the tedious part, so I'm gonna go ahead and just fast forward through this. But just to give you a quick explanation of what I'm doing, I'm using the little seam line as my center line. And the center line is really critical to be able to eyeball symmetry. And you really want to have symmetry. And so I'm gonna take a lot more off the bottom. It's gonna be narrower than the top. And then I'll round the top off pretty nicely too. But there's a lot of material to take off, so let's get started. So I'm done with the belt sander and I was able to shape it pretty nicely actually. It's come out really symmetric, top and bottom. And I was able to taper down the belly pretty narrow as you can see right there. And I've maintained that pilchard shape pretty well. Before I continue to sand, I'm gonna go ahead and drill in the locations of the hook eyes and the tie-on eye just so it's marked so that when I pull it apart, I'll know where those wires will exit so I can make my harness. Besides getting the shape just right, got to get a few saw marks out of this too. So I'll be doing this for a while. I'll get back to you guys when I'm really close to having a perfectly smooth surface. Now I've got to split it and that's always just a little scary because you can really mar it up. I'm going to try to offset it as much as I can. Ugh, contact cement really works. Ugh, there it goes. All right. All right, I've drawn in the path where the uh, internal harness is gonna go. Now I can just start bending. I'm just gonna use the stainless steel leader wire I always use. It's a 174 pound test. All right, so first I'm gonna make the nose twist eye. So now I'll mark the first bend. Now the second bend. I'll mark where I wanna form my eye. And then the bend to the tail section. And then finally I'll mark where the tail eye is going to be. And I'll just put a kink in it and make the eye on that little machine. All right, and then now it's just a matter of tweaking it with my hands and making sure everything is aligned and straight. is what it's gonna look like assembled. And if you're gonna do this, my advice is don't be too precise with your carvings on the inside. Give yourself plenty of slop, because if it's too exact, it gets really difficult to put these things together. For a floating crankbait, I like to keep the total weight at about 85 to 90% of the maximum weight. So we need to know what the maximum weight is. And the way I do it is I'll find the density of the wood I'm using. And here I just took a small piece. I measured the thickness, the height, and the length, multiplied it, got the volume. Then I weighed it and I divided the volume into the weight. 
and that gave me 0.7 grams per cubic centimeter. So that means that now I can weigh the shaped lure and it weighs 23.78 and I divide that weight by the, the density, 0.7, and I get 33.97. So that's 34 cubic centimeters. That's the volume of this lure. And since this thing is gonna have a buoyant force equal to the amount of water it displaces, and we know that water weighs one gram per cubic centimeter, the weight it displaces is equal to the volume. So that's 34 grams of water. So that means the maximum weight for this is 34 grams. So if I put the hooks, the wire harness, and the split rings, I get a total of about 27.6. So I need to add weight to bring it up to about 85 to 90% of the maximum weight, which is 34 grams. So I'm gonna add this little lead split shot and that brings it to 30.14 grams, which is right about 88% of the maximum weight. So that gets us in the ballpark. So I'm gonna place that weight low and, and kind of forward about 20%. I was thinking 25, but I have to consider that I'm putting in a wooden bib and that wooden bib is wanna, gonna wanna float a little bit. So I want yep, fits perfect. Just need to do the other side. Transfer the mark with a little bit of white ink. There it is. All right, it's tacked in place. Now I need to clear out the slot for the bib, but I'm gonna do that after it's uh, glued together. I feel a little more comfortable doing that so I don't bust out any part of the front. All right, let's mix up some glue and we'll get this thing glued together. Probably mixed about three times more than I needed, but you never wanna come up short because you won't have time to mix another batch before it sets up. All right, so obviously there'll be a little bit of post-gluing sanding, but that's all right. All right, it looks like it's pretty nicely lined up. For now, I'm gonna let this thing set for a couple hours. Let's go ahead and draw out the dive bib. And remember, I'm using this little thin piece of the same piece of wood, and I want it to have a, an organic shape. I don't want it to be square or rectangular or whatever. I think I'm gonna go with an ellipse. So I'm gonna go ahead and trace this out and we'll take it to the saw. That should do it. The rest will be hand sanding. All right, I had to rethink that uh, bib that I made because that one was just a little small. Plus I cut it across the grain, which is not a good idea because it'll end up snapping. So I've cut a slightly larger one. So I've cut this one and I've already given it a little concave there so it'll fit in the lure better. And that's the size right there. You see it came out perfect. So it should slide in there and seat pretty nicely. I think that looks like about the right size now anyway. All right, so now it's just a matter of sighting down this thing and making sure it's relatively straight. And hopefully any deviation I can correct with the tie-on eye. I'm gonna glue it in there with some crazy glue. Also spritz it with some uh, accelerator and obviously I got a little carried away here. All right, let's add one more detail, this little tiny dorsal fin. And I'll glue that down with crazy glue too. The only other detail I put on it is some nostrils. All right, so I really do want to keep it as purely wood as possible, but I'm gonna put a black strike eye right there and a little bit of red around the mouth and right here at the chin. All right, that looks pretty good. All right, let's put some eyes on this thing. I think golden eyes are gonna look good. All right, I'm a little concerned that the oils in the teak um, aren't gonna play very nicely with the clear coat. So I'm gonna seal it with some polyacrylic. All right, that's looking pretty good. Let's let it dry and we'll put a couple of clear coats on it. All right, let's go ahead and get this thing clear coated. 
at least get the first coat on there. It's looking pretty good. This first coat doesn't look bad. There's a little bit of grain standing up on the dive bib, but I'll have, I'll have to give that a little sanding between this coat and the next one. And I'm gonna go ahead and set this coat and I'll get back to you when I'm all done with clear coating. All right, I've left it in here for a while. Let's see what it looks like. It's looking pretty nice. I'll give you a close look at it and then we'll take it out to the lake. Hopefully the weather holds and we'll get some underwater shots. But I just wanted to say today is Friday right after Thanksgiving. And I just want to say happy Thanksgiving to everybody in the US. And thank you to everybody who's been watching and commenting and following along with all my ridiculous ideas. So check this out. The finish really came out nice. And that little fin on top does give it some character. And I do like the way that line in the grain really does kind of look a little bit like a lateral line on a fish. All right, I'm gonna put some hooks on this. We'll hook up the boat and we'll head out. All right, guys. Unfortunately, the cloud cover has moved in again and we're not gonna get great shots underwater, but we're gonna give it a shot. I'm gonna go ahead and put the GoPro on a chest mount and I'll show you what it looks like from the surface. All right, so there it is. It floats pretty straight up and down. I'm pretty happy with that. And it's pretty quick to come back up, so I think we got the waiting right. Let's see what it looks like on a slow retrieve. That looks pretty good. It's got a big action. Let's see if it comes back relatively straight here, and I don't have to tweak it too much. That looks pretty good. All right, let's get some underwater shots. I'm excited to see what it's gonna look like. Although, it's gonna be dingy, not much sun, so we take what we can get. Pretty happy with the way this thing swims. It casts a long way. It's got some real weight. I did get a chance to take some pictures in the sunshine a little earlier, so I'm gonna go ahead and put a little slideshow at the end of this. In the meantime, we'll see you guys next Friday. Enjoy your holiday. And if you have any ideas, certainly share them in the comments. We'll see you. <laughs>